All right, all right, all right, Habs fans, hockey fans. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Curfew Boys podcast. First line trio of myself, Sammy, centering Chris Solera on the left and Alex Zook. Zook I got promoted to the right. first line. Come on. First, this is the first line what trio. What a week. <laughs> what a week indeed. How are you boys doing? I'm bad, man. You suck. I'm good. I'm doing pretty, pretty, pretty good. Been watching some Larry David Kirby enthusiasm episodes of the new season, and it's fucking hilarious. Oh, so I still didn't see the new season. So I'm doing pretty, 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 it's, pretty good. It's the final season, eh? Like, the final season. It's the huh. uh, it's the final season of Curb. It's it's, a, it's sad, but but good for him though. What, Larry, what Larry Larry oh. David's done it all. He he's Fuck. done it all. 100%. Rest in peace to to Jerry Lewis, his best friend. Mm -hmm. God, God God bless him, man. The guy the guy was a good like extra character on the show he was complimentary character oh oh god bless him uh did you guys have a good weekend have a good week we're 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 one week away or less than a week away from easter sunday where i know chris and i we're gonna get our uh our eating going we're gonna be eating a shit ton of food especially being from an italian uh italian background mm. we're gonna be eating a lot and I can't fucking wait. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we dine for you, sir. <laughs> I seriously think that uh, I seriously think that there's a possibility that uh, our ancestors, maybe our family, fucking fed Jesus so much that's what killed him. <laughs> <laughs> or brought him back to life. Maybe no, it was the food that no. brought him back to life. <laughs> no, it was. You know why? Because if they would have fed him, he would have fallen off the cross. He would have been so heavy and fat. That's why. If he would have, if he would have eaten Italian style food, the, the the Romans wouldn't have been able to lift him off the cross. Anyway. <laughs> exactly. Porco <laughs> can. What the fuck? Do you... Anyways, all right. So. <laughs> That's actually funny. Who knew we would have brought in comedy and religion into a hockey podcast? Hey, this listen. Is, this is freaking hilarious. This is, this is what you call freeform. This is what we do. This is Jazz. what the boys do. Yeah, I like Poultry that. Poultry in action. Are we are we so 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 Zook, you're basically saying we're we're the jazz type of hockey podcast out there. You could say that. Hey, listen, jazz. I'll take it. I'll take that description. Dude, 100%. jazz if there's All one day. thing I learned, be Play, being able to play drums is if there's one thing I would have learned to do is how to play jazz drumming because hmm. that's like a whole other fucking technical level that I can't even comprehend. Yeah. You watch the movie Whiplash too many times. I love that. You? Yeah, no, but yeah, but that's that's different. That's 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 not jazz. That's that's it is, but it's like big band jazz. It's different. It's not like okay, it's, that's it's what I had like, in mind when you said it's it. Not, it's not like the lounge, like the like the lounge type of jazz, like the smooth lounge bar jazz. Whip, mm. whip, and don't don't get me wrong. I fucking love that movie, Whiplash. It was a fantastic movie. So, uh, but yeah, but even that style of drumming too. I wish I would have learned. But uh, I just stick to the four four beat, rock and roll, John Bottom, just beat the pound of beat the shit out of the drums. But, anyways, boys, let's get into it. But before we do, uh, reminder to all of our listeners that this episode is brought to you by Quick Feet. Quick Feet offers the simplest, most effective way to customize your skates, ensuring you're perfectly positioned every pivot and turn you make. Simply slide one, two, or even three of these insoles in your existing insoles, giving you more power and stability on the ice. Whether you're competing at a highest level, skating as a hobby, or trying to skate like Zook, I'm telling you, Quick Feet will provide <laughs> the ultimate enhancement for anyone looking to maximize their performance. Head over to quickfeet.com. That's Q U U I K feet. Again, Q U U I K feet.com. And now to unlock a 10% discount with our promo code CurfewBoys10, skate into a new era of on-ice performance and elevate your game with quick feet. And once again, I keep using these insoles to play hockey. I played last night and got to say, I I'm loving this product every single so time. So explain to me how, because like you said earlier, I'm not a great skater. So how <laughs> does it really enhance your skating in what it, ways? It, it well, because it if if you look at a skate, the boot yeah. like the toes, the toes are are slanted a bit downwards. They're declining, so, right, right, right? Yeah. Right. So, so when when you use the soles, you kind of bring your your toes up to a bit of like almost so more of a balance feeling. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. it gives you more of a, a, a that edge when you push and all that. And there's different ways. If you go to their website, they they tell you how to check out if you need to insert one, two, or three insoles. Nice. It's really, really, really well done. There's in the package here. It explains how. 
how to uh, how to go about it. And uh, Alex and the guys at Quick Feet, they really uh, they've done a, a great job with this product. So, I yeah, think you really have because uh, Sammy keeps forgetting to uh, you know share. Well, those. Uh, well, I'm God be... knows how many packs he's been he's been through at this point. In time. <laughs> I've only stuck you with know? one. I got Just... the rest. I'm seeing you on Sunday. Shut up. You're gonna get it. I'm gonna slide it in your your. Fucking I'm trying to I'm gonna... prove gonna... a testament to the. Testament back to religion. We, we want to we wanna show how good it is. You're keeping them. You're using them. That's what counts. They're listen, amazing. I'll slide them under your plate of lasagna, and you'll get them right there. Okay, if, on Sunday. If we're in the spirit, they're gonna be they're gonna be eaten. But uh, no, you you, you don't want to. Everything that they put in front of us, we just destroy, devour. Anyways, no, you. you you don't want to eat any insoles. But uh boys, let's let's get uh, started with our lovely Montreal Canadiens. Um coming off a two game winning streak, uh ending the West Coast uh road trip. And it, there's nothing but positives going on, eh? Like yeah. d- do you do do we see any negativity right now surrounding this team? I I I I I honestly I cannot I cannot find a single negative thing as a whole to talk Look, about with this team. I really, really, I can't. I can't say anything negative about this team right now as a whole. Even Marty said it in his first interview back. He's like, he's watching the team from his TV and he was happy to see what he was watching, you know, the stuff he was seeing on the ice. He was happy so to see happy. So how happy. the players were buying into the the whole philosophy that he's trying to instill. Yeah, he and, was he, he was in and, touch with uh, Latowski and even though they didn't win a lot of games when he was away, the spirit was still there. Yep. The fight was still there. And well, they have him that's, to me a positive thing because like you yeah. remember when coaches were changed in the Habs in the past during the you know like midseason uh, mm-hmm. or in the playoffs or uh, with Dominic Ducharme and all that stuff, like mm-hmm. you, you saw, there was a difference of a vibe in the team and yeah. play style and whatnot. That could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending how you're looking at it. Well, you so think like, you think Luke Rich- Luke Richardson when he took over versus Vegas was they played a bit different. I was just about to say when Luke Richard took over, they played some of their best hockey. That's when yeah. they found again and beat Vegas. I found as if it was like, like a weight was lifted off their shoulders, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but they but, said, but or the eyebrows they were lifted. We're gonna re- they did, but they did say we're we feel as though we're ready to go through a wall for Luke Richardson. I never heard that once about Dominic Duchard. But, but that's put a series that also head through a wall and not yeah, come but, through. But but the problem with that's not that there was a problem, but on a, on a physical level, that series ended up destroying them, like physically. Physically, like yeah. I think that's where guys that's where guys got hurt. It was during that series, and they battled they battled it out there like like the toughest guys on the planet. But it was that series that that really hurt them physically and then I, they weren't able to keep up with Tampa but all that let's go back F- first of all super happy that everything's okay with Marty and his son that he revealed he revealed about his son got into he got hurt during a game and then there were more complications later on and that's why he was hospitalized but he's okay he's recovering he's at home so just on the overall like super happy to hear that Marty's it was back a collision happy. or something eh I, I I honestly I just I just Listen to what Marty said uh, okay. when he released. He released a statement. Uh, I don't know if it was. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, something to the head, anywhere else on the upper body, lower body. Honestly, at this point, don't know. My opinion, don't care. As long as the kid's fine, his yeah. family's fine. But uh, Martin McGuire posted uh, or reported that he surprised the guys at the hotel before the Colorado game. I think at 24 hours before, like when he came back, when he said he was he's back, I think before he announced it, he surprised everyone at the hotel and at the hotel lobby. And as guys were coming in, like he was like, they were all surprised. They were hugging him. And apparently there was like, I don't know if it was kids. It was Kent Hughes, Hughes. who was the number one, uh, like, okay, really heartfelt hug. And was it uh, was it Hughes? Was it Hughes or was it somebody hugged Kent him Hughes. and 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 it looked like it was? I don't I I I don't know why I have Caden Gooley in mind. What a management, though. Fuck, what a difference. Dude, okay, it's like it's but but oh, but do we? So under- nice to see. I don't I don't think or maybe maybe we do we do understand finally. Like there there's such a bond with this team. But like at all levels here, like not just within the players and 
and the coaching staff and or at least with Marty specifically. But it, it feels like with everybody, there's a mm -hmm. whole like like as this rebuild keeps going, the more and more we keep finding out how close not just this team, the organization is. And if Chris, if you're there's there's a very good chance you're right. If it is can't use that had like that hug that hugged the guy for like a, quite a few minutes and maybe got emotional here and there. Like there's a strong bond going on with this team and other teams better be fearful of it. I, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not, I'm not messing around. Like this is going to be dangerous for other teams. And, oh, and like yeah. for us, we're like, we're probably witnessing. Hopefully. I know Anthony uses the word dynasty. I'm not going to go that far as a dynasty, but there's really a winning culture that other franchises finally got to go to the Stanley Cup. And I think now, more than ever, we're really starting to see, without the final, without the key pieces coming in, the young players that we're going to mention later in this episode, there's something fucking brewing here. And it's. But I, that's what I said last episode. Like, that's exactly. For the first time in a while, just the talent in the pipeline, the development that's going on with the top players, the contribution from the supporting players, even if we take, uh, we're, we're obviously going to get to talk about Alex Newhook, but Alex Newhook, had he been healthy, that's a guy who was putting in 20 to 25 goals. That's, that's, that's an amazing pickup. A thousand for, percent. Just to stick with the whole culture thing and, and when you said other teams have to be worried, I think the first thing that came to mind was uh, sleep and fear, uh, rest of the NHL. But um, mm -hmm. in all honesty, it's the first time we heard, we grew up hearing there were clicks in the locker room. There was the Koivu and even Kovalev sometimes division. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to go there. I don't want to make accusations that it was too no, young to probably there, didn't there understand. Could been, there, could been, there could have been even the Pacioretty and Subban click there division is. too. There you go. I think for the first time, like not only do we have a lot more skill, the young guys are really developing. We're going to get into the weekend of uh, Montreal Canadian prospect dominance in a little bit, but all the pieces are in place and that culture is clearly coming together through and through and through. And even though we're one of the bottom teams, like you said it again last episode, there are so many positive things to take out. Uh, of of what's happening and there's there's only there's truly only good things and I feel for the first time in all of my fandom and not not counting the time that we went to the finals there was obviously hope but I legitimately think not only do we have the opportunity to be battling for the cup in the next three to four years I think it's going to be three to four years back to back to back that we could be battling for the cup as long as we play their cards right as long as contracts are not overwhelmingly uh bad everything is falling culture talent development uh and, and just that overall bond i think we're seeing just like in all honesty we keep kissing boston's ass for what they established but when patrice bergeron and sedeno uh, chara was was still there what they established from 2011 all the way to fucking 2020 they were goddamn dominant and they were they were a group that's the last point. They were a group that pushed one another so freaking hard. They held each and other they accountable. So much. They held they held each other accountable on that team. And so does Jim Montgomery. And I feel like Marty has that same coaching style too. I think. Yeah. But you, but you know, valid. you know, you know what I and this wants to I, I really want to lead Chris. Everything you said, fantastic. And I want to add in, I think, in terms of the players. I think that's why Nick Suzuki is the captain because of that. And I I think he learned that from the playoff run with Price, Shea Weber, Shea Weber Corey Perry, throw in Eric Stahl in there, throw in, throw, throw, in, throw in Joel Edmondson in there if you want, even if, if you want Jeff Petrie, maybe a Philip Dan, like, Ben Sherrod. Ben Sherrod, you know that, what I mean? But Cole Caulfield was there too, but I think – Nick is I think Nick Suzuki because he was there before Cole like I it's I think it starts with him and I know Chris we mentioned him last episode or last time you and I spoke but we have to talk about Nick Suzuki 
guy just fucking he 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 just attained a new uh uh, uh record career high points career high yeah. in points he just beat last he's a career high in goals a career high in points he's going to be that point per player a point a player guy point per player guy he's going to be that point per player guy point per game player <laughs> Let me repeat that. He's going to be that point per game player guy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Good job. But, but, but <laughs> I, I, I'm serious. Add in the fact that he's learned from a guy like Sean Monahan last season and this season, it starts with him. And it's propagating. I think it's propagating to the key pieces. Obviously, to um, Cole Caulfield, definitely to Uri Slavkowski, who we're going to get to later. And I think on defense as well, but on defense, like Gooley, Jacki, Shrubel, Harris, they have Savard and Matheson to look at as well. You combine all of that together and you mix it up together, there's something there's something good brewing here with this team. Zook, Zook deserves the chance to say it, but I just want to slip in. Because you slipped in the Nick Suzuki point, I am so happy, so, so, so happy that Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield's contracts are going to be the uh, the basis of all future contracts for this for this team. I think we can be competitive with that alone. And if you have a point per game player making that money, it's going to be very hard for other players to come in from the outside and demand much more. So I'll leave it at that and I'll hand it off to Zook because I've spoken enough. No, uh, yeah, you, you both said all. Uh I remember hearing this from Gooley. I remember when I think it was his first season playing with the Canadians full time, if you will. He said something in, it, in an interview where it was something in, aligned to like, we're trying to build something special here. Mm -hmm. And he was alluding to all the kids coming up, surprising, you know, people making the roster sooner than later, all that kind of vibe. It's a couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when he said that they're trying to build something special, it's like you really felt something starting to happen, yep. chemistry growing, all that kind of stuff. And that's what we're seeing right now. It's as simple as, as you guys said it before, build, uh, rebuilding the right way. That's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're going to be, it might take longer than we would want. <laughs> we all want to well, win next year, but, well, okay. but, but, but let's be realistic. Yeah, exactly. if you want to do it right, if you want to be a good team for five to ten years coming, it might take three to four years to do that. You know, but what a, what a game Caden Gooley had uh, against Seattle. Fucking yeah, three points. yeah, he's what had a, a he's had an up and down season, but that's normal for young kids. He's playing, but he's playing on his off his off wing or his off uh, hand. Like he's yeah. a lefty, but he's playing on the right. And man, uh, can you imagine? Can you imagine being a young defenseman who's playing on his off hand against? the top line of the other team playing over 20 minutes it's insane, and not looking out of place. Yep. Like unfucking real. Caden Gooley is unreal. And he's, I get, it, he's still learning. Absolutely. Is he perfect? No, not yet. Anyways, but Jesus Christ, like this kid is fantastic. <sighs> he's fantastic. I, I, I love him. I absolutely love him. He's untouchable. Like, like, uh, who said he's untouchable? I think Pierre Maguire. Pierre Maguire. Says, yeah. Pierre Maguire on the. He is. Uh, he, the... is he is untouchable. You cannot yeah. touch this kid. Him too. I'm curious to see what his contract's going to be. But Chris, like you said, if 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 the contracts of Guli and of Guli uh, of Suzuki and Cole are kind of like the basis, I could see him getting maybe the same like like maybe six if he gets six seven million. I could see that. I would do six point five. Mm hmm. For eight years, for eight 6. years, five for eight years, six point five of the average. If Caden yeah. Gooley, um, I'll say it like this: I agree with Zook. I I would give that in a heartbeat, no hesitation. I think if there's somebody that has to hesitate on that contract, that's Caden Gooley himself, because <laughs> oh. I think he's going to be severely underpaid at a, at a at a at a at one moment in time or another. He's going to be severely underpaid. But there's one thing, and. I don't want to. I don't want to bring the conversation backwards, but it's really going to pertain. And Caden Gooley might be the factor to see what we can expect contract-wise for a lot of other players. Um, it, so I'll start with when you said we're trying to build something special. I think for the first time you actually have not only guys that are just genuinely good human beings, 
Mm-hmm. They're not necessarily gym rats, but they're like they're students of the game. They really genuinely look invested, and they actually look like they truly want to, uh, again, build off of one another. So I think like the off ice problems are are one thing, but the reason why I went back to this and I wanted to, you know, rather than move on to the next topic, we've spent years looking at, especially I think like the Tampa Bay Lightning, and again another one are the Boston Bruins and. I don't want to go there, but even like the Toronto Maple Leafs, when you had Nick Foligno, Jason Spezza, Mm -hmm. that's a whole other level of signing dirt cheap contracts. But I feel really Tampa Bay Lightning was probably the number one in doing this. A lot of really good players signed for a lot less than what they're worth. I understand that the taxes are different, but my God, if we have a handful of players, again, who are just going to, follow along and fall in line with the Suzuki contract, we're going to be able to have like seven, eight, nine players potentially that are really high caliber players, not superstar players, but star players with really reasonable contracts as the salary cap is going up. And really it's just going to be a dominant force for years where they could just add on and change up any player that either gets greedy. If there's another opportunity that comes up and in in that like there's a great free agent that wants to come and sign in Montreal, it it's a it's truly what Sammy said. A lot of other teams have to be very scared and and mindful about what the Montreal Canadiens organization is going to be in a few years. It's it's going to be the place to be. I I don't buy this shit anymore that players don't want to come to Montreal. I I I I don't buy that. I I think a lot of players do. It's just it's it's circumstantial or there's maybe there's some circumstances in their life where it's like I I can't make that transition. So I'd rather go to family and things. Exactly. So I'd rather go to another team that's closer to my home and all that. Yeah. I, I there, there, there's some players that that want to play for a big market. There's like, dude, it it can't be that players don't want to come to Montreal. Yet every fucking year, the Bell Center is voted the best arena to play in. Like it, it, it come on. Like I get taxes, weather, and all that. No, there's a lot more to it than than just that. Okay, it's just there's just some players they just can't. Number one, number two, all the best players out there they're already signed long term with their teams already. So it's not that they don't want to come here, unless a fucking trade goes down. They're not gonna. Th- th- the best players in prime age won't come to Montreal because they're already signed. Okay. So we need, we need, we need to remember that as well, but I'm telling you, if this culture keeps going, people see how Marty treats his players. People see how Kent Hughes treats his players. People see how everybody treats each other. And you convince a pretty good player, whether, whether he's somebody of the past and, you know, changing his role. But if he knows and he's told, listen, you're the perfect guy to play this role, what we need to take our team to the next level, and that's bringing the cup back to Montreal, the players will sign. The players will fucking sign. It's just Crosby. a matter of... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good. Zook, you got it. You read my mind. Oh, man. Ah. You know what? In all honesty, if we were a Come playoff... On. if. Uh, I, I I want believe me. I think like, I want it more than jizz, anybody else. Like the word jizz is Dude, beyond. I I I want to jizz about the thought of Crosby <laughs> playing for the Montreal Canadiens more than anybody in this city, more than anybody within this fan base. I just think where the Canadians are right now in the rebuild, and where Crosby is in his career, man. If we were if we were a year or two ahead mm. of where the plan is. Then yes, I would see Crosby come. If we were a team that was able to make the playoffs, because I see that happening in two years from now. If we were fast forward two years from now, but Crosby was still in the same situation, then yes, I could probably see I could probably see that happen. But right but now, Sam, as of this very moment, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm yeah, I'm not Sam, I'm not too sure. As as of this moment, maybe not, but it's very likely that uh, Crosby is gonna sign a contract extension in Pittsburgh. But even mm, if that's let's say another I, three, I, I don't think so, dude. Dude, I think Kyle Dubas you is don't, ready. You do I not think, think the you, number I, of seats in the arena is the like the last two numbers for the number of seats in the arena in Pittsburgh mm-hmm. is eighty-seven specifically for Crosby. Like they built the whole franchise around it, uh, around him. 
The only way I see this happening is you're saying we're we're if we're two years ahead. I understand, but I still think that it could be something like a Raymond Raymond Bork type Boston Colorado the last push when the Montreal Canadiens are there. Pittsburgh is going to say, "Look, Sid, it's time to move on. You're going to are you are you going to retire? Maybe you'll play one more year, but we're not going to get much more for you than we will now." I do think at that moment in time, there is a possibility that Crosby comes on. And Crosby is not going to be Crosby. We have to think of him more as like a, a much better Eric Stahl or Corey Perry. But nevertheless, I could see Crosby coming in and playing that role at that point in time. But the difference with Crosby versus any of those players is that guy. And I, mm. my God, I'm opening up a whole other can of worms here, mm. but... I genuinely think Sidney Crosby is the best hockey player to ever play all time, all around. Mm -hmm. This guy, it's whatever he's played, wherever he's played at any single level, he has won. This guy just makes shit happen and he wins. He doesn't win every year, but again, you take Olympics, yeah. NHL. He has he didn't play in the AHL because he jumped right into the league, but every oh, no. single competition that he's that. played in, he can take your team mentally – uh, and I think emotionally just to, to another level. So I will not stop fantasizing about having a guy, especially that guy, come Kyle, to Montreal. Kyle, Kyle Dubas is not going to trade Crosby to Montreal at the, next year. Crosby has not, one year left on his contract. Not next year. No, he, no, not he, next year. Crosby's not going to come here on a multi-year. I Like I said, no, he would no, come I here know. at the expiration of his contract, whenever that may be. I next, still think there's an extension, though, in between time. Oh, uh, uh. I I don't know. I just think Kyle Dubas is gonna pull the plug on this team and start a rebuild. Like he's already getting rid of Gensel. He's gotten rid of a few pieces. I think he's gonna get rid of Malkin. I think he's gonna get rid of Latang. If you keep Crosby, maybe. Oh, we got. Sorry, I'm here to I'm here to interrupt. The Laval mm -hmm. Rocket just scored and got a one zero lead over Utica. Who scored? I, I will uh, look right now. I don't know if it's uh, Bissau. I'm not sure exactly. Sorry, Chris, not to not to cut you off. Is that Mayu? Or is it finally fucking uh Jacob Perot? I think it is. I think Jacob Perot finally fucking scored. All right, cool. Good for you, kid. It only took you a long time, but it's okay. I don't I I I I next year is gonna be the big next year in the NHL. The big question is gonna be what's gonna happen with Sidney Crosby at the end of his contract. Look, right now he has 76 points in 71 games. 36 yeah. year old. Yeah. Yeah, insane. He's he's the best player ever. <laughs> he's, he's above the, a point a game. Still, he, he's the best it player. Makes ever. sense. But, but all that to say is, I'd sign him. I, I I don't know. Of course, I would sign him in a heartbeat. Even heartbeat. at the age of thirty nine, yeah, I would sign him. Yeah, uh, just I I I'm I'm not sure. But anyways, Uri Slavkowski. What can we say about him? <laughs> like right now on. March, we're recording on March 27th. This episode is going to air on March 28th. The Curfew Boys put out a post on Instagram. If you could describe your Slavkowski season so far in one word, oh, what would it be? Chris. Progress or development. Okay. Interesting. I Go, say. You, you okay. Yeah. You're... <laughs> you can't use the word jizz. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that to be said. Uh, I'm going to say the word confidence. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what? Uh, in all honesty, expected. I expected him to fucking play like this. Or I, at least I expected him to improve. Like after what we saw last summer of him training and how he was training and what he did to train. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying, right? You expected if, if, this if, if to one, happen. If one word, if I could put in one word to be expected. Yeah. Yeah. It's one word. That's that. Yeah. It's, it's, or, or you know what? Here I'll use in the words of Carrie price. Believable. Oh, hold up. Oh, Sam, I have to ask you, I have to ask yeah. you because yeah. I hear what you're saying off ice, what we saw in the summer, his training, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But another word that I would use to describe it, and it goes, it's kind of a contrast to what you're saying 
it's not a contrast, but it is a contrast. It's a turnaround. Like, at the beginning of the season, as much as he did his training and everything, let's be honest, amongst us three, like, he really didn't look good at the beginning of the year. Like, it really looked bad. Like, please, please. I know we are very much in control of our emotions. We're very much capable of saying he's he's an 18, 19-year-old kid. There's a lot of growth to uh, to be had. My God. Don't tell me when we saw Logan Cooley scoring those crazy goals in the preseason. Don't tell me when we saw, saw how some of the other players and how he was fumbling, not skating, uh, still getting hit. Like, I think every single one of us had a worry. And when you say expected, like, I, I understand expected now. Like, he, he ended up reaching that those expectations. But, my God. Turnaround is another word to to describe he, it because he needed crap, it was you know at the beginning of the season. Well, you know what he needed? He needed more than eighty two games, and he didn't play eighty two games last season. If he played eighty two games, if he didn't get hurt, if he didn't get a season ending uh, injury, I think he would have started the season a lot better than what he did. I'm I'm convinced that he needed more yeah. games. He needed more because, games under his belt because you got to remember, uh, Chris and Sam, Logan Cooley was already playing in North America. Slavkovsky wasn't. Yeah. So that's he had to adapt. Too. And I think his adapting took longer than we would have liked it, say. But that's well, also it, probably it, due it, to the fact that he was injured. Yeah, exactly. When, so, when, you, when you're injured and you only played, how many games did he play? He only played, dude, he played 39. Yeah. He didn't, so, he didn't even play half a season. He so played exactly. 39 so games. The first month of the season, yeah. Chris is right. Uh, it's not as if he was sluggish, but he was still... He was fucking rusty. A millisecond behind the play, yeah, I'd say. I think, I think but he then the second his confidence got up there and Marty gave him confidence. On the top started with started with Marty, by the way. Yeah. Even the way Marty was speaking about him, saying, you know, he's, he's progressing in all facets of his game and all that kind of stuff. And that it's going to, soon enough, he's, ça va débloquer, is what he was saying, yeah. remember? Yeah. And um, once he's... Once he started, it just it just kept on pouring, and every game is getting he he's been our best player consistently. I would say for the last two months, on a uh, yeah on the yeah visual, not, not you know, vi- like on the on ice, dude. He's yes, been he's I, I, I think so too. Defensively too, I find. I think Nick Suzuki has entered the chat, but Slavkovsky is right there with him. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think in terms of the forward group, them on the offensive side. On the defensive side, I gotta give it to um, Jake Evans and Yoel Armia. Like, Armia, I don't know, whoa. I don't know. Oh my God. What? Who? I would lit- say Ar- Armia had the biggest change from the beginning of the season. Dude, he was so, central Laval. The biggest change, uh, pr- pr- probably. When he came back, I, dude, think, I think. I think that. I think that's. I think that could be a fair statement. Yes, in terms of players that had some kind of revelation. Cha- yep, our Yoel Armia is definitely one of them. I, I think I think you all are Mia more than Jake Evans, but Jake Evans has to be in the conversation because once the Vorak was out and then once Monaghan got traded, I, I, forgot think about his, the Vorak. I think his role as a centerman got yeah. grew significantly yeah. and the responsibilities he had now at both ends of the ice were even more than what he was probably used to. That him on the on the penalty kill, him and Armia right now are fantastic. They've turned it around. Like and yeah. they they deserve a shit ton of credit. Like, dude, look what they did with I, I dude against Colorado. Against Colorado, that you're able to shut down Colorado's offense, and that Jonathan Drouin is suddenly exploding. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's it's against Colorado, dude. They're like one of the best teams in the league. You know, he they they shut them down. They they played well against uh, dude, they didn't play bad against Edmonton. They didn't play bad against Vancouver. Against those teams, I thought they were gonna get a spanking and they kept up with them. The only the only off game was was the one against Calgary, okay? Like, but that's it. The others, they didn't they didn't look out of place. And that's so encouraging to see. It's so encouraging to see, especially like at this time of the year, because I think this is a stepping stone of how they're going to approach next season. And next season, it's it's just if if they could keep playing the way they're playing, it's it's good for their confidence when they start next season. That that's my opinion. 
Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> perfectly in agreement. Okay. Well, it, in unison. You know what? Actually, Chris, a player I want to talk about too. He doesn't. We don't really get talk. But Alex Newhook. Like, what would have been if he never got hurt? If he wasn't out for eight eight weeks? Okay. So we're. I'm curious. Like every single game. Obviously, as much as I'm watching the game, I'm still tracking. Like, I'm always opening up the Montreal Canadiens application, just checking what the points are looking like, how close Suzuki <laughs> is to have a, having a point um, per game. Honestly, I just do it, I think, because it's refreshing to actually have a player who's producing mm -hmm. uh, for once, uh, for the first time in God knows how many years. But in opening up the application and, and setting the team line in terms of goals, Newhook's at 12 goals. He's fourth in scoring. Mm -hmm. With 44 games, mm -hmm. Suzuki's got 29, but that's 71 games. It, it, like the 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 goals per game ratio for Alex Newhook, he's honest to God, he's a he's a 20 to 25 goal scorer, which is a huge mm -hmm. addition. We expected him to yeah. score like 15, maybe to, like maybe around the 15 to 20 mark. This is well over 20 that he would be on pace for. Yep. Let's hope that let's look. We don't. I don't know an overwhelming amount about the guy because he's so young. There's not much of like a track record that you can go and base and say, Dude, he's look, always injured or he's always healthy. His college numbers, oh, man. man. He, his college numbers are really good in Boston college. You bought the, we're going to talk about Boston college later, man. I'm telling you, but Good. he's come. He, yeah. Uh, just How to say Alex Newhook stays healthy. He's going to be, I think he's going to be a pivotal player. Uh, the only thing that maybe fans are going to disagree with, you guys are going to disagree with, I'm not 100%. He's good enough to be on a second line and get that amount of time. Dude. But I think he's going to be like a superb third liner. Like top tier, one of the best third liners in the league when, when the team you is really ready to compete. You wouldn't put him on a second line with Kirby Doc on the left wing? I would. I would absolutely. I'm not saying that he's not a second liner. I do think that he's he is a second liner. I'm just saying he – I don't know. I, I, I just got this – maybe this hope that uh, we're going to have another super offensive player to play with Kirby Doc. But no matter what, under any circumstances, whether he's playing second or third line, I think Alex Newhook not only has his place on the team, but he's going to be a pivotal – element that's that's really going to help us go as his as far to, as we uh dream we can go his career high is 14 goals last season with colorado in 82 games this year he has 12 and 44 like you said he's two goals away from time and he's without doc imagine with the healthy doc and as a would center, have, you would have been 25 a, goals as a centerman with 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 uh a few times with uh with joshua Roy, a few times with yoel armia like not exactly has he doesn't have exactly. top six Imagine guys. a creepy doc dude. dude there he's hitting 20 I, 25 goals dude i think he's hitting 20 25 easily it helps him have him being on the power play helps too those yeah. two goals against seattle he's such a perfect cool. skater though eh? like a fantastic skater and i think that's what a guy on the wing a guy like kirby doc that's what he needs yeah i think i i i, I truly truly think that marty has to try those two next season uh, i so, not in disagreement. I just want to be perfectly clear with you guys. I'm no, not no, no. It's with just, that. it's, it's, you, you know. I, but I, but I like you bring up the question where you still think they need to have some kind of top player, for lack of a better term, a top six player to play with Kirby Doc. I just I, I think, think in hold all on, honesty, hold on. it hold depends on, on this draft. It's gonna depend on this draft if they draft that player or if they trade for that player. That's there how I go. see it. I don't think. I, I truly don't think Kent Hughes traded for Alex Newhook the way he did just to see Alex Newhook be a top nine instead of a top six. Mm. I, can, I can't see it. I really can't. I can't see him being a third-line center when once the Christian Dvorak is gone, Owen Beck is going to take that spot, and he's having a fantastic season in the OHL. And he's right now he's, he's in, entering his playoff mode. Then after that, he's going to Laval next year. So you give Owen Beck that full year to develop in Laval while Christian Dvorak takes the, the third-line center role pending that Kirby Doc stays healthy. Do you see the timeline of this thing going on? 
I was 100%, and that's why I said it last episode, in three years, I think the Montreal Canadiens are going to be a mm-hmm. fucking scary team and competing, like truly competing. I, 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 Everybody's got a lot of these teams in their mind. Like who are – I'm asking you both. Who are your Stanley Cup um, – uh, not contestants, Jesus. Who are your Stanley Cup uh, – Les Prétendants, Jesus, I'm thinking in French. Who are, who are the most lethal teams this year? But, like – there's no way that Boston is going to be able to keep this up. There's no way that Toronto is going to be able to keep this up. There's no way that Tampa is going to be able to keep this up. Florida Panthers are going to come apart. Vegas, I don't know how the hell they're going to maneuver around the cap. Toronto Maple Leafs, done. All the teams that are really know. dominating at the top of the league, like I don't know how they're going to do it cap-wise. They're going to have to kind of blow up like the – the only thing is the Chicago Blackhawks, they did perfectly fine. But when Andrew Ladd, Dustin Bufflin – um Brian oh, Campbell they, and everything they had they them just signed perfect they had them signed perfectly because they knew that those guys were all free agents and they were going to man the race and they but, Chicago couldn't afford it but Tampa Boston uh Toronto uh to a certain degree Florida they have some of the worst prospects in their prospect well let's even throw a Carolina Carolina is okay I think they're better off than those those three teams that were mentioned yeah, but Carolina like man. Montreal can, like please let's be honest with ourselves the ones who are truly up and coming but I still don't think that that's the difference if you take Anaheim Ducks I don't think the Anaheim Ducks have the core to take on Nick Suzuki Caulfield Doc Slavkovsky I really don't think they have a crazy amount of prospects but I genuinely don't think they're there you take oh, the Detroit Red Wings who are another I don't team. know about you take Anaheim, the Ottawa man. Senators uh dude don't I'm just saying and I'm, I'm not you, saying that they well that was it was the first team that I mentioned for a reason Anaheim has some of the best prospects yeah but I'm talking about winning culture with talent with toughness with discipline who knows? If they I build, don't if think they, the Montreal if Canadians build are going to be touched. Uh, I don't know, man. Dude, I, okay, hold on a sec. <laughs> Anaheim Ducks in the future, like, listen, I don't think they're going to get rid of Trevor Zegers like everybody thinks they will. You have him, you have Leo Carlson, you have Mason McTavish, and you have Cutter Gauthier coming up. Chris, that's that's fucking solid. That's I like, named that's them like, first for the a reason. <laughs> they're they're going to be the next. So, so you know how the Toronto Maple Leafs? Kind of built the team around Matthews Marner, um, Nylander, Nylander, and and I think Toronto. I, I think Anaheim is going to be kind of like that, except they're probably going to be have to be careful with how they distribute those contracts and not have five players control more than fifty percent of the fucking salary cap of the team. So we'll see. But we'll see. It. But that's why I'm saying the much and. I can't emphasize. I I don't feel like I have the capacity to express myself in uh, properly. To to say that, like, do you not notice the stars are aligning? Like, down to the amount of money that they're going to be asking for their contracts, to the way that they approach the game, to the culture within the locker room, to the balance of talent and and certain toughness, to like all all the distribution of talent, not only being up top. But also on defense, and I think now's the time to maybe transition into the weekend of uh, Montreal Canadiens glory prospects. We have one of the top tier goaltenders. We have all positions, all with like everything is just falling in line. We still need that. We still need that top six forward. We do one more, and I think. And again, I think Hughes and Gordon are going to either draft him this year or they're going to trade for him this year. I really, really think so. You want to talk about? I'm ready to talk about it, but like, what a fucking weekend! Habs Nation got to see on Friday, on Saturday, and on Sunday. I I don't even know who to begin with. I don't know if we should begin with the Laval Rockets, with the arrival of David Reinbacker. I don't know whether to begin with Jacob Fowler and just being like, yeah, I'm the next Dominic Hasek, just <laughs> just American style. I don't know if we talk about Lane Hudson and who just likes to, he thinks he could toe drag everyone and snipe it in the net on a power play. I don't know where to begin about Hudson versus Fowler. I don't know where to begin about Logan Mayu sniping a game winner in overtime and how the Laval rocket fucking three games in three days. And they won all three. Yeah. Fuck it. We're, we're, we're on the top. Okay, it's Reinbacker. 
All right, Zook, perfect. <laughs> you 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 just you just got the topic started. I don't think. I don't think it's a coincidence that Laval won three games and three nights right after David Reinbacker shows up. I don't think it's a coincidence. I really think this team saw someone within the organization that's drafted top five, obviously, and probably brought some kind of new life, probably brought some kind of extra reason to fight because right now Laval is playing for their playoff lives and they only have nine games remaining, including the one that is playing being played at right now against three teams that they're trying to catch up to the Belleville senators and the Toronto Marlies. Listen, the way that David Reinbacker, the first game we saw the highlights, everyone saw the highlights. I did not expect a fucking Bobby Orr toe drag deke and snipe it to tie the game with less than three, four minutes left. Like, that, I, I don't think we realize how much even that lit a fire under their fucking asses for the Laval Rocket. I And, and I think, you know, we talk about team, team culture and winning culture amongst the Canadians. I also think it propagates to the Laval Rockets where there's no egos. I don't think there's any egos on this team because let's be honest, depends the team, depends the players. When you're 24, 25, 26, and you haven't made the NHL yet, you see a young kid, 18, 19 years old, coming from Europe, knowing that he's going to get a chance one day. Sometimes the jealousy kicks in. Sometimes, like, fuck, I got to shit. Now my spot is I, there's a lot more competition for my spot. I really need to wake up or something. I don't think there's any of that with this, with this whole franchise, this organization. And you saw it. You saw it with the Laval Rocket. They they do they played for one another this past weekend. Three games, three games in three nights. David Reinbacker played three games in 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 in, in a month in mm -hmm. fucking Europe. Kid comes here, plays three games in three nights. No problem. What a development. Uh, no problem. Aid. It's gonna be this. Oh fuck. No, no problem. Dude. I'll fucking toe drag you. I'll his snipe it. Skating oh. though, man, his skating ability is fantastic as well too. He was not his out of place. His dude, his positioning is so far. Dude. I don't want to use the word perfect, but dude, it, it, it's it's like okay. he's been it's like he's been playing in North America all Sam, season. When you saw Gouli play in Laval the first time, who? Gouli. Gouli never played in Laval. He never went to Laval, so he went straight from no. the OHL. From the OHL straight to the NHL, yeah. I thought he did, he did a stint at Laval. I, 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 no, 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 sure? no, no, no. Oh, dude, dude I'm, I'm, I'm a thousand percent positive. I, I saw him. Like, I saw my U. Even... I saw my U. I saw Jack I. Okay. <laughs> who else? Who else? Like, yeah, so then, it, so then it must have been uh, my U then. That I don't no, want to okay, give okay, you. Okay, okay, well, hold on. Hold reference. on. A second. Hold on. Gooley did play three games in Laval during the, the, uh, the COVID season. Okay. That's what I was talking. Okay, so okay, sorry. I'm sure, sorry. I remember seeing his name in Laval once. Yeah, but th this is when there were no fans in the arena. And yes, okay. Did you see the, the way he was, let's say, inserted in the team and how he was playing versus how Reinbacker? Do you see who I, I think, who was better? Let's say I think there's similarities. Okay, there are similarities. I, okay. But I, so but then I think, he's at that I level think, then. Okay. But I think Gouli, Gouli has a bit more of that aggressive side to his game compared to okay. Reinbacker. But in terms of in, in terms of not looking out of place, in terms of proper positioning, defensively, that's what I mean. Defensively, yeah, de very similar. David Reinbacker, so far, what I've seen, he's only made one little. He's made one little turnover in game two, and I think another turnover in game three. Just whatever. It's gonna happen. He's a rookie in this league, but his his first pass out of the zone is perfect. His, his, his dude, his poise, though. It's the poise. It's being able to be calm under pressured situations in his own zone. Yeah. Do you think he's going to make it next year? Ooh, that's a fucking good And question. if so, who would, what place is going to, what, what place will he be taking or whose place? Hmm. Well, I honestly think Justin Barron's 
position just got threatened a little bit by how about Kovacevic? Maybe, maybe Kovacevic. If anything, dude, is Mayu gonna make it? Well, who, has, who, who, who has a better chance of making it next year, Mayu or Reinbacker? I'm answering a question with a question, but I don't know. This is I think, fucking... think Mayu. I think I think the Montreal Canadiens are going to do it properly. There's there's one there's one thing too. You can look at it as though Mayu is going to stay down another year and he's going to dominate another year. But Logan Mayu was already an AHL All Star. Mm-hmm. He was already he already set the record for goals by a defenseman. As a rookie, like, as a rookie, yeah. he's exactly that. They might say, "Look, uh, we just want you to continue playing as much as you are." Like, I think there, there's two angles. Just continue, like continue to dominate. Your time is coming. It's a question of time. We're going to be respectful towards the veterans on the Montreal Canadiens players uh, on the Montreal Canadiens uh, team. But the second that one of these players uh, is out of the picture, traded, injured. You're our guy, but in between time, we value like we value it a lot more that you're you're in development and you're on the ice for 25 to 30 minutes a game. Hmm. However, if for some reason David Savard goes in the off season, if I'm not going to say Jonathan Kovacevic because Jonathan Kovacevic is a is again a seventh defenseman in in my mind, sixth or seventh defenseman. Yep. Uh, I think I think. If I were to make a legitimate predict like a prediction with regard to this, it's going to be the second that David Savard is gone, because I think Logan Mayu is only going to come in when he's going to be a second pairing defenseman or even first pairing defenseman, not before, not after, because it's his development is way too precious. And same thing for Reinbacker. Like I think it's even more important that Reinbacker has a full year development in the AHL before it's even a question. But out of the two. Mayu by a long shot because he's already had this one year and because he's dominated as much as he has. But out of respect for the players that are here and the positioning that they're they're going to be in, I don't think either of those guys come up from Laval to Montreal before trade deadline 2025. Well, uh, 2025. Jesus. Mm-hmm. Let me let me add one more element to you. I think. It's without a doubt happening that Lane Hudson is going to sign with the Canadians at the end of his NCAA season. So do you take a full year to have David Reinbacker and Lane Hudson develop together as a pairing in the minors next year? If he does sign, yes, absolutely. Because if you remember last camp, remember the chemistry that they had? Dude. They were fantastic. Build it now. Now build it. Yeah. Build it professionally for a fucking whole season, dude. Mm -hmm. Come on. If you want to build your team right, you do that. I think. I think. I think that could be. I think that could be a smart move. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, we've always talked about this. But then, do you guys foresee maybe the defensive pairings of the Canadians in the years to come to be different? Because in my mind, it's always been maybe after next year. uh, Goulian Reinbacker. Are you guys recommending that it be in the in the long run more Hudson and Reinbacker? And Gouli and Mayu and Jack I and who? I I, I always say right, Jack, Jack right, I no, staying no hold, matter what. Hold on a sec. Right now, Jack, Jack I and I Mayu are great lineup. together. I don't see so, yeah, the lineup change. That'll be yeah. awesome line. But Chris, you said you really foresee Mayu coming up once Savard is gone. Right now, Jack I is playing with Savard, and I force until Savard is gone. I see that pairing staying together next year. I see Mathis and Gooley staying together next year. Then I also see, again, maybe Jaden Schruble with Kovacevic and Harris. I don't know if Harris will get traded. Out of the defensemen, I personally think maybe Justin Barron's time is 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 up. He's an RFA at the end of the year. Maybe I- maybe they trade him. Maybe they trade him in the offseason or before or before the uh, the or before draft day. I, that that that's what I see. That's what I see going on. And within that time, unless again, unless Lane Hudson and David Reinbacker have an unbelievable training camp, where it's like yeah. there's it's, no doubt, it's possible. It, it is possible. But until that happens, I really see them staying 
in the minors for one more full year. And if Mayu doesn't make the team, he's the next call up. I a yeah. thousand percent. I see him being the very. I see him being the very first call up uh, on defense if ever there's an injury, whether it's on the left side or on the right. No matter who's injured and they need seven defensemen, Logan Mayu is going to be the first one called up. Agreed. Fair enough. You want to ask something, uh, Zook? Yeah, I just want to think of a shout out. To, uh, we don't talk about this player that much for some for for, for some reason, and mm-hmm. not only us. I'm saying even in the league, and mm-hmm. the NHL, in the media, Mike Matheson, unreal, dude. He's a 50 <laughs> point defenseman. He's almost the hate, the hate, the hating 50 the point defenseman in the in the league. Dude, the hating and the bashing needs to stop. Like, I don't get it, it. I don't get it either. What a fucking the, the nicest shorthanded goal from any of our defensemen since. God knows He's, who on this team, dude. Like it's enough now. It's done. Like I, I get. I'm pissed off with Matheson on the blue yeah. for like. I'm just impatient for Lane Hudson to be our power play quarterback. I'm just saying, Mike but, Matheson is but not Chris, a power play quarterback, and he fumbles. But Chris, the all the time. he's he's doing something. Okay, like he, what's the word? He's uh, fuck. I want to word it correctly. He's doing things out of his comfort zone. Let's say. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. still has 50 goddamn mm-hmm. points almost mm-hmm. and trying his best. Dude, he, he, he's playing with what he has, right? Like we're a decimated team, uh, young and this and that and all that kind of shit. He's trying to do the most that he can. And, you know, he he may be doing things where he's not naturally, I would say, suited for. So I get what you're saying, Chris, but you can't bash a guy and say he's fucking know. I'm not, shit. I'm not bash, or... I'm bashing <laughs> plays of his. Yeah, I that's going to happen. Guy. When you're doing I things that are that's what happens. Just, I love the guy. I think he's, you know, we spent a whole bunch of minutes earlier on in the episode talking <laughs> about how the culture is developing. Right. And I think Mike Matheson is a huge part of that culture. I think he it's is. a huge yes. he's, I did men- he's I those- mentioned that for the defenseman. I did mention that, yes, at the beginning. Yeah, he's he's yeah. he's absolutely selfless and he's a great human being. And I love it's just sometimes yeah. it's frustrating because uh, the, the, I think the frustration comes because he can go down the ice, he can break past the defenseman, and he can do the most incredible shit. And then other moments, he's got you pulling out your hair going like, what the fuck kind of stupid decision is that? And and I think that's the the frustrating part. Like, he is truly achieving something special. Uh, He's got his place on the team. He's got his place in overtime. It's just at moments, I I, I think maybe he grips the stick a little bit too tight. He's not the best at controlling the puck at the line. He makes maybe some questionable decisions, especially defensively. Yeah. He's got a horrible plus minus that 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 showcases. Uh, but that, I, don't, but I don't care about that. Stat. Nevertheless, yeah. that stat is. I don't care about that stat. Me too. How, how many point. how many of those minuses came because because of uh, because of goals that happened when they they pulled the goalie with with less than two minutes left and they only lost yeah, by like one or two. You know what I mean? A hundred percent. I'm just saying. I love Mike Matheson. If you want, I'll get a I love Mike Matheson t-shirt for the next podcast episode just so that we're clear. Do but it. <laughs> the guy, the guy just sometimes sometimes I I, I just would love to know what's going on in his head because I feel as though there are moments on the ice where you know the monkey that's just clapping the symbols together. Like I, I feel as though that sometimes happens to him when he's this, on the ice. I think this is the first time in his career where he's had to quarterback a power play. There you go. In 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 in, 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 in Florida, good. in Florida, when you're behind Ekblad, Ekblad's a quarterback. In Pittsburgh, it's Latang. This is the first time where he's had to quarterback a power play. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's never I don't think he's ever done that in his in his NHL career. If he I, he, he might have been on second pairings. I, I don't think he ever was a quarterback on the first pairing to the I best of my memory that. and my knowledge. So then if that's the case, like, like he, he would, good, man. this is the first time in his career where he's the number one. He's the number one defenseman on the team. Again, yeah. Latang, number one, uh, Aaron Eckblad in Florida, number two, uh, number one, excuse me. So. It's a big, it's a big adjustment. It was a big adjustment period for him. I don't know, man. He's nearing fifty points in seventy-one games, man. That's pretty good. He's, he's, <laughs> I don't agree with some of the some of the plays too. Like, I question sometimes why he doesn't pass it to Slavkovsky often on the power play. Maybe he's trying to. Maybe it's because he wants to fool the, the other team because they expect it to come. 
when you got Caulfield as well. Like, I don't know what he's thinking, but like for some hat fans <laughs> to say he's got to go, he's got to go, he's got to go. It's like, no, stop it. He's helping you yes. win games. I single-handedly think, though, Mike Matheson is the reason why Cole Caulfield is not going to hit 30 goals this year. No, I He disagree. cannot pass no, to him. He I cannot disagree. pass to him on the power play for his life. Because he's on the his offense. life. <laughs> put Caulfield up where Slavkowski is. He's going to give it to him. Hmm. He can't, he yeah, can't but pass. But it's a one-time shot. Dude, okay, you know, that's you know, what, know, but that's what I'm what saying. Do you know the angle? When you're a left-handed guy... And you want to pass it to a guy on the left that's a right-handed shot. You know yeah. how difficult that is? Yeah, like it has it's to be perfect. So I understand I understand it's difficult. And I'm not like I'm I'm Joe Schmo. I'm I'm pro versus Joe right over here. Like uh, there's there's no comparison, <laughs> but I guarantee you, uh, this is and this is fucking pissing me off. I guarantee you, when we're gonna have a guy like Lane Hudson, I'm saying like Lane Hudson. Oh, I yeah. can't wait for that guy to be well, our first day that, that Lane Hudson gonna have steps Lane onto Hudson. the ice. Yes. The second that Lane Hudson steps on the ice to play as the Montreal Canadiens power play quarterback, it doesn't matter if he's fucking left-handed. Whether it be a backhand pass, they're going to be chef's kiss. Beautiful. I, Beautiful I, tape-to-tape tape pass. Again, I, I, get, I, I will put money. I will put money down on it. Mike Matheson is unable to make a proper backhand pass, and that's why he has to shift his whole body to turn it to make that nice pass to, to Caulfield. He's incapable of doing it on his backhand, which is much quicker and easier. And when we finally have that guy, think of Kale McCart. Look at Kale McCart on the back, and I'm not comparing freaking Mike yeah, Matheson yeah, yeah. to Kale McCart, <laughs> but I'm just saying Kale McCart can make a freaking backhand pass to uh, to the guy on either side of the ice. And until we have a well, until we have a guy who could properly feed at the same time either Slavkovsky or Cole Caulfield, Mike I get Matheson what you, is I, just I a random what, player for now. Again, I Mike Matson for the first time in his life, he's quarterbacking for ever in a season. He's quarterbacking a power play. I think he needs another defenseman to help him out. I know the four, the four fours, and one defenseman. You add in another. You maybe what if the pairing is Lane Hudson and Mike Matheson next year? What if? I'm just saying. I'm just throwing out there. I'm just throwing it's out the J word. Out. Listen, I've had a, a tough enough update. Sorry. A, Please don't, 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 don't start. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, how about uh, how, how about Jacob Fowler here? That's another J word. <laughs> okay, Literally, so that that save was. You know what? You know, yeah. You know what? Uh, what I have playing in my mind every time I hear that name, Jacob Fowler, is that video that that the Canadians organization posted of of all the scouts in a room together. Contemplating who to pick, dude. Billy, right? The scout, the scout and, Billy, that and, fucked and that scout was like Fowler is a goddamn winner. I, he's never seen a guy co consistently yeah. be, uh, you know, elite at, at that level since he was a kid. Yeah, winning everything he wants. Like mm -hmm. he's, he's driven. That's what I, I, I see, and you can see it in the in the type of saves he does, dude. He just he's fucking aggressive. He gets the he gets to the puck. He, he, Dude, he wants to eat the puck, basically. He's so confident. He, he huh? dives at it this weekend. Like, this weekend, that dive, insane. like you're saying. So. Yeah, he just wants to. He wants it, and that's something, dude. He's gonna be, dude. I cannot wait three years, or I would say three years, gonna be the Canadians. Three, so, maybe three to four. What do you think, Sam? That he's gonna be in the Canadians, dude. Three years. He, he's he's turning twenty years old. Oh, he's fucking young. So, okay, so then. No, but no, but you know the thing. So. Oh my god, what a what a save by Dobesh. Is he turning 20 years old or is he turning 19? No, because no, he's he just got drafted this past year. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. You you could you could you could be drafted at the age of 19 as well, huh? So yeah, I'll tell you right now. No, no, but he got no, in, uh, he got he got drafted in 2004. So he's 19. Yeah. yeah. So here's my question now, because again, Pierre Maguire stated that if Boston College wins the championship, which they did. They might lose a lot of their players, a lot of the star players, like Will Smith, Cutter Gautier, I think Ryan Leonard, I think Gabe Perot. I, I, I get a feeling that they're all going to get signed this year by their NHL teams. Hmm. And if that happens, I I don't I don't know. I don't know if Fowler's gonna do one more year in college or if he's gonna get signed. I I honestly 
he he's got the big out of out of between him and Lane Hudson, there's I'm I'm willing to bet my left nut that it's that Lane Hudson gets signed a thousand percent. And they begin their be they begin the uh the the the, the not the frozen four tournament, but the the, the championship Bean tournament. Pot? Pardon me? Bean pot? No, no, no. Bean pot is just the uh was just like the Boston area. Boston? Oh this, this so the NCAA down. championship then. The this, NCAA pretty much, yes. So like so like okay. right now, so like uh hockey east hockey east uh, association boston college beat so jacob fowler beat lane hudson the big 10 that's where wisconsin is i think michigan's in there too there's there's a few associations in the ncaa every winner goes to this frozen four tournament and then they select another four i think another four teams to like like kind of like the runner ups go there too so so even though lane hudson lost the, the Hockey East Championship, he's still going to this Frozen Four tournament. It's only a one game, like, you got to win. As soon as you lose, it's over. So, Joey said this one. Joey said this, I think, earlier this week. He's like, he, he selfishly hopes that Lane Hudson loses because once he does, he's eligible to sign with the Canadians and he's going to join the Canadians right away. He can't go to the, he can't go to the minors. He's going to burn a year off his contract. He's going to join the Canadians. And I have it here. He's supposed to play on the first round is is next Thursday, the 28th. It starts. So tomorrow. Wait a minute. What are we? Oh, my God. You're right. It starts tomorrow. <laughs> Jeez, Jesus Christ. I, I mean, I'm on vacation with his girlfriend being on vacation. Dude, I'm, I'm in here. I'm, I'm already gone. So. <laughs> so. Like as Habs fans, like what do we what do we want? Do we want Lane Hudson to win? Do we want Jacob Fowler to win? Like what's to me winning these these tournaments is huge for their development, in my opinion. I think I think I'll say this much. I want Jacob Fowler to win more than more than Lane Hudson. Okay. And I know that's gonna sound ridiculous, but you want Lane Jacob playing the Canadians. Jacob Jacob Fowler, going back to the conversation that you guys just said, I want him don't lose. I mm -hmm. have to win everything. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get to the bunch of Canadians, apply that same freaking thing. I've won everywhere that I've played, and I'm just gonna carry it over right into the NHL. Is it gonna happen immediately? Maybe not, but in the eventuality, I will bring my winning ways and my winning habits back put them into effect and be parading around uh the bell center ice with a cup over my head who 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 gets who gets number one him or uh, motombo fowler yeah no you think so? Yeah, you guys think so honestly okay. there's a, a like let's not go here but honestly the way Caden primo is playing right now <laughs> do we want to do we want to restart the goalie debate because well, Caden Primo is being fucking Anthony and I, Ant crazy. Anthony and I mentioned it. I think I, we're gonna have another uh, another three goalie carousel going on so, uh, again in 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 two years. This all depends if they resign Primo or not. This all depends if they extend Montembo or not. They are have to figure out what if Jakub Dobish keeps improving the way he has in Laval. I'm gonna go off on a limb and say the following. I think either Sam Montembo. We keep talking about Jordan Harris and keep talking about Justin Barron being uh, key trade pieces from the defense. Don't be surprised that when Fowler is ready, I genuinely and wholeheartedly think that we're going to go get something special for one of our two goaltenders. Uh, I, I think, I think honestly, if Primo continues this way and he's not necessarily part of the future plans, or even does it matter? Even if it's Sam Montembeau. We could get the Kings ransom. Like you think of this mm -hmm. year, if we if we encounter another year where there's a goalie demand, holy crap! Like what can we go get for Sam Montabo? And, 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 and I and think I think Sam Montabo and Caden Primo is going to be like a, a Swayman and uh, Allmark Mark. type of forty forty. Could be, but 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 the best thing about it is that they're cheap. They're they don't have expensive contracts. Okay. No, I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, Montabo and 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 Primo. So if you have to. If you do have to trade one of them, you could trade them for for a good price and get, get maybe maybe something good in return. Like you said, the king ransom. What helps is that they don't have big contracts. Thousand percent. It's 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 definitely a possibility. But man, all all that to say is, 
these these are the the pieces that we rightfully so were so excited about but it's it's like you want to see them perform at the highest capabilities and the fact that they have they are at least right now in their respective junior um seasons when they're coming up big in big moments like that tr that transitions into the pro level they always they 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 got that mm -hmm. they have it so this is fucking exciting now i also be paying attention to it we're gonna end this off uh, real soon i'm gonna be paying attention to the ohl and the chl the playoffs because you got one back that's participating you got florian jack guy who's really turning heads you know like he's scoring he scored 30 goals this year like him too he might join i have a feeling he might join laval next year back to back to ncaa you have luke tuck uh, lane hudson's uh teammate He's definitely coming into Laval, so it's exciting. Philip Machar is going to come to Laval. I, I mentioned Owen Beck before. The timeline for all these pieces is aligned. It's all aligned. After next season, I really think we're going to see the team that's meant to take us to the promised land. Take me there. Mm. That's oh it, boys. Go, go, go! Do yourselves a favor. Go look up. I believe it's the 2013 Stanley Cup playoffs. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's playing uh, the the it's the Who, uh, teenage wasteland. It was the Stanley oh, Cup okay. playoff production. Okay. And just close your eyes and listen. Are you kidding yeah. me? I listen to that intro every time <laughs> I prep myself to go to hockey. <laughs> the best, well, the best and they redid it. They reused it for the Toronto uh, Montreal. Oh, now you ruined it. Yeah. The, the, just do yourselves a favor. Dude, go watch that clip and envision the Montreal Canadiens. Like, literally, it's time. Montreal, it's time to start. Uh, it's, it's the uh, best. Visualization it's into one of the reality. Best hockey night in Canada openings for a playoff montage ever i listen to that one and i listen to every year when they have the closing montage after the stanley cup has been won i i, I chris i i kid you not i listen to those every every day every no not every day every time i have a game like to prepare myself i listen to those i have full blast you can ask the girlfriend too like i tell her don't bother me i'm in a fucking zone okay i listen to these I prepare my bag. I put my fucking quick feet soles in there and I'm in the fucking zone. Chris, if we play in a league this summer, like you need to, you have to do that too, eh? I'm just, I'm just letting you know. I don't even play and I close myself off in the bathroom with my headphones and or my office and I'm just listening to it. And just, what are you, what are you, what are you doing in there? I'm, I'm, I'm watching hockey, hockey. intros. <laughs> It's not even believable. It's not even believable, but that's what's going on. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's 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 fantastic. I think we could end it on that note. Zook, do you do anything in the bathroom with headphones on and uh, yeah, but uh, it, it can't be spoken about on this platform. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. As soon no. as we log off, you're gonna let us know what you do in the bathroom <laughs> with headphones on. Cool nah. boys. I'm 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 good to end it on, on this note. I don't know about you guys, but I'm good. We said it all, boys. We said it all. Listen, uh, to all our viewers who are uh, new to this podcast or have, have been with us since day one, yeah. thanks for tuning in. Uh, join the conversation. Let us know your thoughts about what we spoke uh, what we spoke about this episode. Do you think Lane Hudson is going to make the Canadians next year, David Reinbacker, or Mayu? Do you think Fowler is going to join the organization? So many questions asked about this Montreal Canadiens organization and the prospects, but one thing we do know for sure is that the pieces are being put together and we cannot wait to see the final puzzle. Don't forget, this episode was sponsored by Quick Feet. Again, go on quickfeet.com to get your 10% off for your Quick Feet insoles. Code CurfewBoys10 at quickfeet, Q-U-U-I-K, feet.com. Thank you so much for tuning in, everybody. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is growing. We are feeling the love. Please Continue to share the love. It is free. Tell your friends about us. Tell your fellow Habs fans about us. Uh, we cannot wait to keep growing this much, all Canadians community. All our episodes available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. We are on Instagram, and we are definitely on Twitter. I think that's it. 
Chris? Happy Easter for everybody this upcoming yeah, weekend. Absolutely. Happy Easter. Go egg hunting. Eat a lot. If you're Italian, we know you're going to eat a lot. Uh, I don't know when Greek Easter is, Zook. I think you might know because I think you got some Greeks oh, in your family. But like, I do. I do have. But uh, it's definitely not yet. It's probably in a couple. Yeah. Of yeah. So enjoy that, too. I know Greek Easter is a fucking blast. Lots it's in of food. May, actually, this year. Food, food at midnight is the, probably one of the greatest things ever. Especially when you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Laval Rocket game, fighting for their playoff lives. We'll definitely see you next time. The Canadians will be home Thursday night against John Tortorella and the Philadelphia Flyers, and who knows who he's going to help to scratch that game. Until then, bye now. Bye now. Good night.